Dr. Heather Darby is an extension professor at the University of Vermont, and she studies a range of topics from nutrient management to hops. She's worked with organic dairy farmers in the Northeast to develop forage systems that improve economic viability. You're not going to talk about beer today. I'm not going to talk about organic hops, but I could. Mm. Yeah. Um, she also owns and operates an organic farm with her husband, Ron, and son, Flint, in Vermont. And your presentation today deals with improving soil and forage quality to improve both productivity and farm financial viability. Is that right? Yeah, that's, yeah, okay. that's what we're going to do. Great. So um, thank you, and we'll hop to it because i got a lot to cover. Um, <clears throat> so your photo was much nicer about the summer <laughs> slump, but um, so Kelsey already talked about the summer slump that we experience in the Northeast because we're primarily growing cool season perennial grasses, which means they like a cool season. So the minute we get any kind of heat, which isn't really a lot of heat in the whole scheme of things, they essentially go dormant. They don't grow hardly at all, and the quality of that feed goes way down. So really for our farmers, it's really tough for them to have enough pasture during that summer slump. Now these weird squiggly lines here on the bottom actually are the, the other point I want to make to what Kelsey was talking about is the fact that we can no longer predict when the summer slump is actually going to happen. And over the time that I've been in Vermont, I've only seen, um, you know, sort of what I would call a normal summer slump, probably three or four years. And now we had our summer slump last year in September. And we had our summer slump the year before at the end of August. And we had our summer slump the year before that over an extended, you know, from essentially May until July. And, and so this whole kind of climate, <clears throat> whatever is going on, is highly impacting how farmers manage their pastures. Everything we knew before um, is sort of out the door. So anything we, we used to be able to predict of having a summer slump, um, is, is really out the door. And so what we're looking for are real, really strategies um, on how farmers are going to adapt to how the climate is really severely changing um, in the Northeast. And I don't um, know if you know this, I just learned this fun fact, um, and I'm sure you have your own here in, in California as we do, but Vermont or the Northeast in general now um, has two inch or seven, 77 percent increase in two inch storms over the last 10 years and it's sort of the, the highest increase in anywhere in the country. You guys don't get any rain anymore and we're getting all the rain and, and massive rainfall. So really all of this is changing how we operate and again you can see these are the species we primarily grow in Vermont um, and then you can see that they're most productive in the early spring and they gain a little bit of productivity in the fall but in the summer they go way down. But essentially whenever it's hot and dry they don't produce, and whenever it's nice and cool, cool with a lot of moisture, they produce very well. Okay, so we're doing very similar things as they are in New Hampshire. I'm an agronomist, so I, I consider the animals, of course, but I'm really focused on how to best grow the crops that then they're trying to feed to the cows. Um, and again, you know, what we're facing in Vermont is um, something we're unfamiliar with. We're really good at growing grass in Vermont, and... Um, and farmers didn't really worry about this new pasture rule too much where they had to meet some minimum amount of dry matter that didn't bother us. But in 2012, when we had this sort of drought, um, farmers were having to dip into their stored feed that they would normally feed now to get through the summer. That's not something we worry about. Um, and so people were running out of feed. We had feed shortages. They weren't meeting the pasture requirements. It was a whole different world. So, you know, the climate is causing us to really change, again, the way that we think. So the other piece here is that um, almost all the grain that organic dairies use in Vermont is imported onto those farms. We hardly grow any of our own grain. It's really expensive. So the longer we can keep animals out on pasture, um, in really high productive pasture, lots of biomass, the more cost it, effective it is for our dairies to operate. So, you know, really that's what we're trying to do. So this is similar to what was just talked about, but one of the things we really want to do are plant these winter grains so that we can harvest them in the early spring. <clears throat> in where I'm from, in northern Vermont, this is, this is on-farm data. This has been as early as the end of April, you know, which is usually for us the grazing season starts mid-May. So almost a month earlier, two weeks, three weeks earlier, 
Um, you might get a freak snowstorm in May, but people can get their cows out. That's really important because then they can get them off the stored feed. They can get them out in the fresh air. They can feed less grain, very high quality. So this is by the 3rd of May. We had already produced 2,000 pounds of dry matter on this organic dairy in Vermont before they had even started grazing um, their perennial cool season pasture, which they started the 14th of May. And the first grazing, um, they were harvesting about 656 pounds of dry matter. So essentially, you can get a ton of dry matter before you'd even normally get those cows out the door um, grazing. This is fully tilled fields. We don't have any farmers um, strip tilling like that. It's not common at all because what they're really going for is high biomass production. And they're essentially refitting fields, low um, fields that need to be renovated that have been beat up or they have them in rotation. That's where they're doing this kind of stuff. Um, so again, this was an on-farm project. So if you want to um, see, you know, uh, if you're into videos, instead of reading research journals, which some of us are, I like vid videos. Am I the only one that likes videos? Come on, you guys, okay? We throw in some, some uh, statistics in it even. I mean, it's, it's legit, it's official. Okay, but um, this is on Earl Fournier's farm in West Swanton in Vermont. And basically this is just showing you the grazed portion of the triticale versus the ungrazed. And the cows are very selective. They actually just go out there and clip the tops of the plants off with their tongues because it's very palatable and it's the best stuff. And again, so this is real life grazing versus, you know, just going out there and clipping with our scissors. They're basically taking off 1,300 pounds of dry matter, which is a significant amount of dry matter before we barely even have leaves on the trees in Vermont. It's huge. And then you can also see the crude protein, the digestible fiber, and the NEL. Um, it's just highly significant for an organic dairy. This reduces their gran grain bill quite considerably over what they're feeding in the barn. And then the overall health of the cows, of course, is greatly improved. So farmers are using this now in Vermont uh, very successfully. And, um, you know, the nice thing about these small grains is that the weather in Vermont, again, is unpredictable. So if we get a snowstorm in May and the farmer can't get the cows out to graze it and it gets by them, you know, because you want to graze it when it's only, you know, six to eight inches tall, like don't sweat it because not all is lost. You can actually go out and harvest these small grains for forage, stored feed in the boot, the milk stage or the soft dough stage. And, you know, part of what we've studied in Vermont is when should they be doing that? When are they getting the best feed uh, for their cattle? And certainly what we found actually is harvesting in the boot stage for stored feed or in the soft dough stage essentially gives them the best feed for their animals. So that's something we've looked at. And if you're into, you know, forage analysis, this is the NEL and you can see the net energy of lactation is highest when it's pasture, just like any plant, right? As it goes into a reproductive phase, the sort of forage quality of it goes down. And then you can see it goes up again in the soft dough stage because it's becoming grain at this point. So you actually have starch, right? So that's why the quality goes up. So our recommendation to farmers, of course, is get it in the boot stage if you can. And then if not, don't, if you know, try to avoid the milk stage go back out and get in the soft dough stage and put up like a high moisture kind of grain feed. Okay, so we've also spent a lot of time, so this might answer some of your questions too, looking at all these different grains, spring, summer, fall, um, wheat, oats, barley, triticale. <clears throat> if you're gonna graze the grains, um, we've basically found that there's not a whole lot of difference. Um, yeah, I don't have all my A's and B's in here. It got to be too much for me. I get stressed out over all those little text boxes I have to make. But, you know, essentially, when, when it's really um, in that very vegetative stage, they're all pretty leafy. And as long as they overwinter very well, um, these are spring grains, this particular example, the, um, the biomass isn't that different. And neither is the quality. But if you think that you might harvest them for feed, that's when quantity and quality really starts to change between species and even varieties. And you know, the sad thing about all of this is there's very little research done actually looking at varietal differences in forage quality and quantity. Um, you know, grain, you see grain variety trials that, or small grain variety trials, it's for grain, it's not for forages. But I will say that's changing, and you can see all of this in gory detail on my website. Um, but we don't have enough time to talk about it now. So the other thing we've been looking at is um, looking at beneficial fats, omega-3s, kind of all the rage. You know, you buy them milk with 
high omega threes in chickens and mm -hmm. eggs and or you just buy some pills and eat those but you know what we're really trying to do is increase the level of beneficial fats in the feed that the animals are eating so that then the meat and the milk or the eggs that they produce are also high in those beneficial fats so we have looked at that um, in small grains and of course what we find and we already knew this mm -hmm. is that when you harvest anything in the vegetative stage that's really leafy um, and green it has more omega-3s in it which is why animals that are out on pasture grazing green grass have higher levels of omega-3 in their milk and their meat so that's sort of kind of a no-brainer but what we really wanted to know is you know are there differences in the actual species and there were some differences and really sort of what it comes down to is a leafier plant with less stem has higher omega-3s okay because there's more soluble chloroplast material in those plants all right okay so what's really exciting to farmers about this is that if you are going to till the ground up and go through the expense of doing that then you want to be able to be double cropping, harvesting more than one crop, grazing it more than once. You want to utilize it more than just going out there and harvesting one crop off of it, okay? So what we're doing is taking the small grains, planting them in the fall, or this is what farmers are doing. They harvest those the next spring, either grazing or for stored feed, and then they go in behind that, and we can even do this in Vermont, right? It's pretty cold there, and they're planting a second crop. A second forage crop that does better in the heat of the summer, like a summer annual, sedan grass, teff, sorghum, some of the ones that were already um, mentioned. Or some farmers are actually going in and planting corn for corn silage, too. Okay, so these are all the different annuals we've looked at from a grazing and stored feed perspective. Um, I'm not going to talk really in detail because I don't have time, but teff and corn are really not very good for grazing here anyway or in the northeast okay so this is perennial pasture in august you can see the quality here versus a bmr sedan grass which is a warm season annual that likes to grow in the heat so you can immediately see the difference in quality and this is again from earl fournier's farm where we were doing this it makes a lot of sense for him to plant this crop i don't have the yields here but i'll show you those in a minute okay all right so here's the sedan grass yields and you can see he is actually able to graze this crop three times, which is quite a bit, you know, for his investment. And, um, you know, he started grazing it in August. And you can see the return cycle here, which is very short. You know, you're looking at two weeks. Now, when you talk about perennial pasture that time of the year, you're looking at 40 days before you can go back and graze that again. So you, you think about the land base you have to have to wait 40 days. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, you know, and when this question of will farmers plow up fields to do that, yeah, it makes a lot of sense, especially if they're limited on land. Okay, so you got two weeks here, and then you got a bunch, about a month here, it goes back a little more slowly, but I mean, the biomass is highly significant. Um, it's highly digestible. The only thing we're kind of working on right now is how to manage the fertility of it because it takes a lot of fertility to grow sedan grass. Okay, and you can see the crude protein goes down because there's not really enough nitrogen there to feed the crop. So, and when you're grazing, you know, you can't really go out and spread manure on it because the cows reject it. Quick question. Yeah. If you have a really nutrient-enriched soil, mm -hmm. can you, would you end up growing sedan grass with a higher... Yeah, and I would, I mean, this is a really rich soil, but you look at all the biomass, so the tonnage you're removing is quite significant. Or like so. if it was enriched by like if, if it had been a chicken pasture or something. That probably would do it. Yeah. Yep. Um, and you can just see the difference in the color, you know, so this is a first grazing last grazing. I mean, it's still really good feed. It's still better than what they're going to get in perennial pasture, but you are draining, draining the soil. So we're working on that a little bit. Okay. So then again, if it gets ahead of you, which it often does because that time of the year it grows really fast, you can harvest this stuff for stored feed. I mean, high, high biomass store feed. We're looking at, you know, four tons of dry matter from two cuttings um, of sedan grass. And I mean, that you don't know, you know, if that's good or not. It's good. Mm. I'm telling you, it's good. Okay. <laughs> it just is. So um, our farmers like to graze, graze sedan grass and millets over these other ones. Sedan grass is leafier, smaller leaves, smaller stems, so the cows are more familiar with how it looks and they can utilize it better. Same with the millet, it looks more gra like really grassy, um, like the cool season grasses they graze, so they don't 
get confused out there. They can go right at it. Um, the sedan grass and the sorghum, they don't like those as much. They look more like corn. They're harder to sort of wrap their tongues around a, you know, a big thing, thick thing of corn. Um, and they also don't grow back as well if you're grazing them. All right, so this is following silage corn. And um, we have a bunch of farmers doing this too, okay? We have water quality issues, terrible, terrible, terrible water quality issues in Vermont. Um, and so growing these small grains acts as a cover crop, which is great for water quality, um, provides us extra feed in the spring, and then people are planting corn behind it, so they get even more biomass. So this is soft dough harvested grain, boot harvested small grains, followed by corn silage. It's a lot of dry matter per acre, 12 tons of, 12 tons of dry matter. Nice. Not 12 tons of as fed right. feed. That's a lot. It's a lot. If, if you don't know, that's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's good. So anyway, so there's a lot of combinations of annual forages to use. Um, the other benefit, of course, to putting those uh, small grains in the corn rotation is help suppress weeds in the corn. It's a pretty good reason to do it. Okay, I got a few more things to talk about. Actually, 15 or 20, but I only have five minutes, so it's okay. <laughs> But, um, okay, so the other thing, not to avoid our, our perennial grasses, because this is really the foundation of grazing in Vermont, and we really have to deal with the fact that the climate is changing. So I'm just going to talk about some of the things we're looking at. Um, this is all the tall fescue varieties that are available in our region, just to show you the range of yields. Okay, that's yield and quality that you would see amongst these varieties. We, um, it's really important for us to find the best varieties and highest quality varieties for our farm. And this data just does not exist. You'd be surprised how little data there is for dairies, organic dairies specifically, or any dairies, when it comes to perennial grasses and variety selection. There's almost no information. So we've been just looking at variety trials for under organic production. The other thing that we've been doing is looking at how well our grass species pair with clover um, and other uh, mixtures because one of the things that I found by working with organic dairies is that some grasses seem to do better with clover than others. If you're an organic dairy, you have to have legumes in your mixture. You cannot be growing monoculture grasses um, from many perspectives, not just a feed quality perspective, but also from a fertility perspective. You can't afford to um, fertilize a monoculture grass on an organic dairy farm and keep it productive. You just can't do it. You have to have clover in there. So we, we have found, you know, through our work, this just started this year, um, is that the grasses do seem to establish better with clover um, in our system. And then we've, we're looking at different grass species that are common in Vermont on organic dairies. And you can see that some grass species like brome and timothy really establish better when they're planted with clover than if they're planted alone. And that's actually really, really important. Um, and then meadow fescue and orchard grass don't really seem to care, even though we need the clover in there. Mm -hmm. And honestly, <clears throat> these two are very easy to establish versus the other two, which seem to be more difficult under organic production because of weed pressure. And then, you know, this sort of gets into the detail of how different varieties actually pair better with clover than some. So there really are even specific varietal differences that we're looking at. What do you, what do you think that is? Is that Just their growth stature? I have no idea. Um, it's, it's, it's been fascinating to look at these just really closely, especially last year. I don't have time to talk about all of it. But for us, the big thing right now is what we see in organic production especially is that um, uh, farmers in our area are being sold grass species that I barely ever heard of before um, and varieties. And so what's happening in our region is people are planting these really fancy expensive mixes and they don't survive. Um, and it's really important for us to know that because seed is expensive, okay? So here's perennial ryegrass in Vermont, which is touted as being the absolute best feed, dies in Vermont. Meadow fescue, great feed survives. Very important, okay? Um, and then this is fasciolium and other grass that's showing up in mixes. There's none in here. You see any? It's like a one there, I think, okay? Um, and then the other th issue we're dealing with here are, are diseases. Um, diseases we've never seen in Vermont before wiping out our, like, mainstay crops. Leaf diseases. 
And so now we have to go through, um, you know, this work of figuring out what varieties, what species are not going to die from rust, from leaf spot. I don't even know what these things are. We're still trying to identify them, but we've never seen them before. So a lot of new work to do with climate change. Um, just to wrap it up, I have been doing a lot of work with fertility, and I know that Cindy's going to talk about that, so I'll skip over that. But one of the things we are starting to use in Vermont, which I never, ever thought we would, is it's we're because she's been it's because of Cindy <laughs> um, is irrigation, you know, and somebody asked, you know, was that naturally fed and usually it is, but we've started to evaluate irrigation and here's some data. This is from um, not this year, but the year before, which we considered a wet year mm. um, and we still saw a benefit from irrigating. So this is days between grazing cycles, non-irrigated, irrigated in the heat of the summer. You know, so 25 days versus 16, 32 days versus 22. In September, that's when our summer slump came. Um, Earl had to stop grazing at the end of September, which is not normal for us because there was no feed there. Wow. But where it was irrigated, we were able to actually get pasture. This is the yield increase from irrigation, which was there no matter what. Um, and the thing here is it really sucks to put your cows in the barn October 1st and not have any feed because you're dipping into stored feed reserves. Um, it's money, just, you know, people are, this is important. Anyway, so he's adopted irrigation full force now. The investment wasn't that great. All right, there, there's a bunch of money people have given us. It's been great. We've really appreciated it. We wish they would give us more, but they never do, especially when you want it. Thank you. I don't know if we have time for questions, but. Any thoughts on those cocktails that are being planted, whether yep. or not that those are because there's like some allopathy going on or something like that? Is there some kind of, you know, like sedan grass puts off that? Yeah. Mm. So we've tried. So now we're in this process of like doing these annual cocktails. You were, you were sort of mentioning those because farmers actually want to put legumes in with their sudan grass. Oh, sure. We haven't been able really to find anything that combines with it well enough that you don't reduce the bot. The biomass because mm. sedan grass is so competitive loves that heat we've tried to put in some of the cocktails and I mean just in terms of what you're gonna you know the productivity out of it mm -hmm. so there's a trade-off if you put something in there Got it. right I don't yeah. know if that makes sense so, yeah did we clap I think we need to oh, oh yeah <laughs>